Poetry presents Out of Your Mind, Essential Listening from the Alan Watts Audio Archives. Session 7, The World as Just So, with Alan Watts. A lecture on Zen is always something in the nature of a hoax. Because it really does deal with a domain of experience that can't be talked about. But one must remember at the same time that there's really nothing at all that can be talked about adequately. And the whole art of poetry is to say what can't be said. So every poet, every artist, feels when he gets to the end of his work that there's something absolutely essential that was left out. So Zen has always described itself as a finger pointing at the moon. In the Sanskrit saying, tat tvamasi, that art thou, Zen is concerned with that. That, of course, is the word which is used for Brahman, the absolute reality in Hindu philosophy. And you're it, only in disguise, and disguise so well that you've forgotten it. But unfortunately, ideas like the ultimate ground of being, the self, Rahman, ultimate reality, the great void, all that is very, very abstract talk. And Zen is concerned with a much more direct way of coming to an understanding of that, or thatness, as it's called, tathata in Sanskrit. So Zen has been summed up in four statements. A direct transmission outside scriptures and apart from tradition. No dependence on words and letters. Direct pointing to the human mind. And seeing into one's own nature and becoming Buddha. That is, becoming enlightened, awakened from the normal hypnosis under which almost all of us go round like somnambules. It's extraordinary how much interest has existed in Zen in the United States especially in the years since the war with Japan. And naturally, I've often meditated on the reasons for this interest. I think, first of all, the appeal of Zen lies in its unusual quality of humor. Religions aren't, as a rule, humorous in any way. Religions are serious. And when one looks at Zen art and reads Zen stories, it is quite apparent that something is going on here which isn't serious in the ordinary sense, however sincere it may be. The next thing I think that has appealed to Westerners is that Zen has no doctrines. There is nothing you have to believe and it doesn't moralize at you very much. It's not particularly concerned with morals at all. It's a field of inquiry rather like physics and you don't expect a physicist to discuss authoritatively about morals, even though as a human being, he has moral interests and problems. But as a physicist, he is not a moral authority. Or if you go to an oculist or ophthalmologist to have your eyes adjusted, that is so you can see clearly. And Zen is spiritual ophthalmology. Another thing that appeals very much to Western students about Zen is that they've read their Zen from Suzuki and from some of my writings and from R. H. Blythe. And these people present a rather different kind of Zen from that which you will find today in Japan. They present what is essentially early Chinese Zen from the old writings ranging from about Peace. shortly before 700.